Welcome to the appendix, where we read the primary sources of the past so that you can better understand the present. Today's primary source The Cambridge Platform, 1648. The Cambridge Platform grew out of the challenge of the authority of the Congregational Church by William Vassal and others who petitioned for the removal of civil disabilities of non-members of the church. A synod met at Cambridge September 1st, 1646 to discuss, dispute, and clear up such questions of church government and discipline as they shall think needful and meet. The third session of the synod in August 1648 adopted the Westminster Confession as its creed and formulated the relations of the church and state and the duties of the clergy in the Cambridge platform. In 1649, this platform was laid before the congregations and by 1651 was adopted. This event, says Fisk, may be regarded as completing the theocratic organization of the Puritan Commonwealth. Chapter 17 of the Civil Magistrates' Power in Matters Ecclesiastical It is lawful, profitable, and necessary for Christians to gather themselves into church estate, and therein to exercise all the ordinances of Christ according unto the word, although the consent of the magistrate should not be had thereunto, because the apostles and Christians in their time did frequently thus practice when the magistrates being all of them Jewish or pagan and mostly persecuting enemies would give no counterance or consent to such matters. 2. Church government stands in no opposition to civil government of commonwealths nor any entrenchment upon the authority of civil magistrates in their jurisdictions, nor any wit weakeneth their hands in governing, but rather strengthening them and furthereth the people in yielding more hearty and conscionable obedience unto them. Whatsoever some ill-affected persons to the ways of Christ have suggested to alienate the effects of kings and princes from the ordinances of Christ, as if the kingdom of Christ and his church could not rise and stand without the falling and weakening of their government, which is also of Christ. Whereas, the contrary is most true, that they may both stand together and flourish, the one being helpful unto the other in their distinct and due administrations. The power and authority of magistrates is not for the restraining of churches or any other good workers, but for helping in and furthering thereof, and therefore the consent and countenance of magistrates, when it may be had it is not to be slighted or lightly esteemed, but on the contrary, it is part of that honor due to Christian magistrates to desire and crave their consent and approbation therein, which, being obtained, the churches may then proceed in their way with much more encouragement and comfort. 4. It is not in the power of magistrates to compel their subjects to become church members, and to partake at the Lord's table. For the priests are reproved that brought unworthy ones into the sanctuary. Then, as it was unlawful for the priests, so it is unlawful to be done by civil magistrates. Those whom the church is to cast out, if they were in, the magistrates ought not to thrust into the church, nor to behold them therein. 5. As it is unlawful for church officers to meddle with the sword of the magistrate, so it is unlawful for the magistrate to meddle with the work proper to church officers. The Acts of Moses and David, who were not only princes but prophets, were extraordinary, therefore not imitatable. Against such usurpation the Lord witnessed by smiting Uzzah with leprosy, 
for presuming to offer increase. 6. It is the duty of the magistrate to take care of matters of religion and to improve his civil authority for the observing of the duties commanded in the first, as well as for observing of the duties commanded in the second table. 7. The object of the power of the magistrate are not things merely inward, and so not subject to his cognizance and view, as in unbelief hardens of heart, erroneous opinions not vented. But only such things as are acted by the outward man, neither is their power to be exercised in commanding such acts of the outward man and punishing the neglect thereof, as are but mere inventions and devices of men. But about such acts as are commanded and forbidden in the world, yea, such as the world doth clearly determine, though not always clearly the judgment of the magistrates or others, yet clearly in itself. In these he of right ought to put forth his authority, though oft times actually he doth it not. 8. Idolatry, blasphemy, heresy, venting corrupt and pernicious opinions that destroy the foundation open contempt of the word preached, profanation of the Lord's day, disturbing the peaceable administration and exercise of the worship and holy things of God, and the like, are to be restrained and punished by civil authority. 9. If any church, one or more, shall go schismatical, rendering itself from the communion of other churches, or shall walk incurgibly or obstetationally in any corrupt way of their own, contrary to the rule of the word, in such case, the magistrate is to put forth his coercive power, as the matter shall require. The tribes on this side, Jordan, intend to make war against the other tribes, for building the altar of witness, whom they suspected to have turned away therein from falling of the Lord. Finis. Thank you for joining us for our primary source today on the appendix. We will see you in the stacks.